So once he waters it, then there's a division between that was never there between husband and wife. It didn't start physically, it started in. Right in the heart. Because this is really your heart, not here. This is the physical part. This is your heart. And once that took place, she then, what she do with the fruit that she wasn't supposed to eat? What's the Bible saying? Hey, with your Bible turn to Genesis, please. I want you to see it for yourself. I don't want you guessing. So, yeah. I think it's scary to me. Look at Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter 3, you guys should know Genesis if you don't. Basically, God had created the world perfect, finished it on the sixth day, the seventh day, he rested. And then in the chapter 3, an interloper, a third party, comes into the scene. This would be like the extra boyfriend, the extra girlfriend, the extra you know, person that gets in between that relationship and another. So we got chapter 3. You got it? Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more what? Subtle. Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. And then she added these words, which God never said. What? Neither shall you touch it. Now she added that. What does the Bible say about adding to God's word? One of the, first of all, don't do it. In Revelation it says you're going to add the plagues to you. Right? It says, lest you die. Verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. That's doubting God's word, right? God said one thing, the serpent says another, but you didn't believe. Had God given them any evidence that he was a liar? No, he proved to them. He created right in front of Adam the very creatures he created the days before, just so Adam could see it. God's not about not giving evidence. He'll give you evidence. He also wants you to see that evidence and to believe by faith. Because he's not going to keep creating in front of you if you don't believe it. That's the point. All right, he's going on. So, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes. Now, does he mean your physical eyes? No. Could they already see? Yes. Could she see the fruit? Yes. Good. So, what eyes is he talking about? Your mind, your knowledge. Then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. They were already as gods, knowing good. God just means those that have dominion given to them. They were in stewardship. They were as the children of God. Psalm 82, verses, uh, I think it's 2 and 6 says that. John chapter 10, verse, I think it's 35. So it says this. And when the woman what? Saw. So that means she already had physical eyesight, right? Mm -hmm. That the tree was good for food. Was it good for food? No. It was not good for food. Because God said, don't eat it. Therefore, it's not good for food. It was good for a lesson, but not good for food. And that it was pleasant to what? It was pleasing, right? That's what sin is. It's very attractive looking, right? And a tree to be desired to make one what? Wise. Wise, full of knowledge. She took of the fruit. She did what? What happens when she took? Did it belong to her? What would you call that? She stole. She stole. Well, first she had to covet it, right? Yep. So it broke the Tenth Commandment. Then she had to steal it, right? That's the Eighth Commandment. Do you think of any other commandments that she might have broke? All ten. All ten. All ten. James says you broke one. How many did you break? All. All of them. If you think hard enough, you'll see she broke all ten right there. It's committing idolatry, right? You lifted yourself up in the place of God. Dishonoring her. It is dishonoring to her father, right? Because her father said, don't eat it. I'm our God in heaven. Right? It is adultery, yeah. spiritual adultery. You left the faith, and you became a doubter and something else, and now you blame it upon someone else. She bore false witness. Why? Because she claims to be a child of God, and yet she's following the judgment. Right? So if you really think hard enough, you'll see exactly how she broke all that. So how does it break the Sabbath? Well, what's the Sabbath commandment say? Six days shall thou labor and do all day work in the seventh day, right? It's a rest. So it's not just one day of the week. The Sabbath commandment encompasses every day, including the day she took of that fruit. Right? She did a work she wasn't supposed to be doing. She was supposed to be resting in her Lord God, trusting in Him, in His wisdom. Like I said, you think hard enough, it's all there. So it says, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and then also, it says, gave also under her husband with her. Now, Adam was not standing right by her side. If Adam was standing right by her side, Adam should have what? Spoke up. Told her no. Because who's the head of the household? The man. They're both equal, but the man is the head. It says, and he did eat. So, he had to go find her. When it says with her, it means in the garden. It's like, it's like saying this. I and my wife go to the mall. My wife is in the phone store. But I'm with her. But I'm in the sports store or whatever. You can pick your store. Am I still with her at the mall? Yeah. yeah. We're together at the mall, but we're just in different stores. So when it says with her, it doesn't mean like he's standing right by her. It just means in the area of the garden. All that that means. All right. Talking about Eve. So when Eve listened to that third party, that secret boyfriend, the serpent, did that bring tension into the relationship now? Did it? Yes. Yeah, not only with her husband, but with who especially? God. Right? So society itself 
And the reason why we have all the problems in society today is because of that one heart, that one doubt that led to sin, right? You guys follow? All right. I don't want to talk about it too long. I just want to show you that even in Genesis, you can see what's going on. If you want to take it before Genesis, where was the first sin? In heaven, right? Who sinned? Lucifer. You find that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, right? Also in Jude and a few other places, they didn't sin, right? They kept out their first estate. Uh, God says the muscles of your iniquities, your iniquities trapping. Was Lucifer a son of God at that point? He was. But because he began to doubt in his mind about the truthfulness of God, did it break their relationship? Did it break his relationship with other angels? Right? And you find that in Revelation chapter 12. So society of heaven became broken. Because faithfulness, the, the real marriage <coughs> of heaven, the faithfulness between the created and the created, was broken. Let's take a look at this. Rule number one. Here we go. So it's so the 17 rules. We're just going through this little study. There's a lot more you can really think about uh, this marriage in your Bible. Let's take a look at Genesis 2.24. And I'm going to read from the King James because I just like the New King James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Genesis 2, 24. Let me know when you get there. Amen. Amen. I got one amen over right here. Amen. Amen, okay. It says this. King, read Genesis 2, 24. Oh, you get uh, Oni. Therefore shall a man... No, no, don't read it from there. You got to read from the King James. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. Society is built upon the husband and the wife, right? From Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. Now, when a child leaves, what do we normally do in modern society? You raise them, you send them off to school, they go to college, right? You make them leave the home. Is that what the Bible says? When you're ready for college, then let them leave the house? It doesn't say that. It says when they're ready for marriage, when the husband or the father of that family would basically choose the bride for them. Who chose Eve for Adam? Uh, Adam's father, right? God. Because in Luke chapter 3, it says Adam was a son of God. And it's Luke 3, 38, if I remember it. So, as a son, Adam didn't get to pick his wife. He relied upon his father, who was more knowledgeable, more wisdom, right? More experience, being from God, for his wife. Because Adam could have picked any one of the animals, right? Right? That's why God was showing him all the animals. And Adam's like, nope, that's not the right one. That's not the right one. God was leading him step by step, saying, are you going to trust me to find the right one for you? Or do you want a beast? There are many people who have married a beast in these last days. You think it was a man, or you think it was a woman. What you really married was a beast. But you didn't know. You didn't wait upon God to choose the man or the woman for you. And a lot of people these days do not respect or honor their parents and choosing for evaluating, I'll put it that way, a husband or wife for you. A lot of children said, I just like her, like Samson. Get her for me, she pleases me well. And it brought Samson a lot of trouble, didn't it? So, God must be involved in the relationship. If it isn't, who will is involved? The devil is involved, right? There's no neutral, there's no Switzerland, there's no like, right? If you're not allowing God to be involved in that, choosing, or the relationship itself, the devil is definitely going to be there. And that can go for every day of your life. If God is not the first thought in your life, how shall I keep my husband? How shall I keep my wife? By God, the devil will tell you how to do it. And then you begin eating of the fruit, and that's how argument starts. When Eve took of the fruit, and then finally gave it to her husband, so sharing, right? She became the marketeer for the devil. She became the door salesman for the devil, right? And then he buys into it. Did that save their marriage? Did that help their marriage? Did it exalt their marriage to another standard? What did it do? It debased it, brought it down. Argument. They started blaming one another. Is there any blame in marriages these days? Absolutely. Is it going to start? It's all the fruit. If you're eating the wrong fruit, instead of the fruit of the Spirit, God says you can eat all these other fruits. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, the trees of the garden. You take a bite of the fruit of bitterness. 
fight of the consciousness, the fight of the fruit of the envy. And that's what leads to disagreement in the home. You gotta realize, what am I eating? What am I putting into my mind? What am I feeding myself that causes this division? You gotta, you gotta go from the end result and trace it back to the very first seed of where that began. If you don't, you're gonna end up with the same result every day and nothing will change. Trace it back to the origin and then you can pluck it up by the root and pass it out of your life and it's gone. Salvation is simple. You're allowing God, by Jesus, the Holy Ghost, to lead you back to find out where the problem is. And in marriage, it takes how many people? Two, no. Three. three. Yes. Who's the third? Jesus. God himself, right? I'm not going to get into all God has on Father's own. Just God for now, right? Because who united Adam and Eve in the beginning? Did you guys read that? If you not, you can read it right in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. That it was God that brought the woman to the man. He was the first, that's the first marriage ceremony right there. So, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, right? I'm going to read it from my King James because I like it better here. Leave his father or his mother and shall cleave to? Unto his wife. Unto his wife. Why? They shall be one, one, one flesh. flesh. So, I really want you to think about this. Do you go around just slapping yourself in the face every day? No. Do you go around punching yourself in the stomach every day? then why are you meek to the other part of your body? If the husband and the wife are one flesh, the man is the head, the, the woman is the body, think about that. Every mean word, every mean action, leads to destruction of the body. It's like an autoimmune disease. Right? You're literally, you think, it's all my wife's problem. It's all my husband's problem. No. <laughs> Remember, one flesh. There's a problem in the body, you have to solve it together with God. Because he knows the answer. He's the one that put the marriage together in the first place, right? For instance, if God built the first car, wouldn't he know how to fix the car? Yes. yes. Right? So you've got to ask the mechanic. You've got to ask the physician. You've got to ask the marriage counselor. Jesus. Right? You've got to cleave. And cleaving means there's no separation. The Bible says what God has joined together... Let no man separate or put asunder. Right? And if you're going to do that by mean words, you're really putting yourself asunder. Therefore, you are breaking what God had joined. If you really believe God was involved in your marriage, then why don't you ever try to separate it from the angry and the mean word? I'm not saying you can't have a disagreement. I'm talking about just this nitpicky kind of stuff that could come up in marriage. So here you're single, what do you know? Because this subject deals with more than marriage. It deals with every relationship. Father, son, mother, daughter, uh, husband, wife, brother, and sister, sister, and brother. It's all talking about the same thing. Because in heaven, there is no marriage like there is down here on earth. It's something totally greater. Well, that's not like that here. Jesus said, you'll be as the angels. You're all brothers. The white marriage is going on up there is between the son and his bride, the church. Not even his people. So it says God's rule is what? Specific. It's not vague. So should our goal be to be to send our child off to college? No. It says when they're ready for marriage, that's when the child leaves the home, set up their own home, and then it's church. It's church growth. The original church growth is marriage. People twist it and use it wrong these days. Think all convert for her, all convert in my marriage. That's not what it says. A married couple must leave father and mother and establish their own home. Why? Think about it. Why? Why must you leave the home that you were born and raised in? Why must she leave the home that you were born and raised in? Why must they have their own home? You can have your own. Own what? Okay. They're still part of your family, right? You didn't just abandon father and mother, right? They're still father and mother, right? In fact, you gained one of the father and other mother, right? That's why King Saul said to David, my son David, right? Another place says, my son-in-law is David. Uh, like Ruth, right? And Naomi calls Ruth my daughter. Another place says, my daughter. Right? So you gain parents that way. You gain a wider family. 
But, but why, why establish a new home? Besides your church program. Yes, that sand wasn't the only way. So you can become one. So you can prove what's in your way box. I want you to think about it. The children that are in the household, who do they got to obey? Parents. The children in the household, who do they got to obey? Parents. Your parents. Parents. And if you get married, I want you to think about this. If you remain in the house, can those other people start affecting your marriage? Yeah, because they think, oh, I think you should do it this way. Right? I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to godly counsel. I'm not saying this. I'm saying it can become a problem. Right? Because you, as husband and wife, should then go to God together as a family. It's no longer relying upon your, your father and mother, your parents, per se. And being guided. Now you're saying, I'm taking the next step, and now God himself is leading. This is a new family. Because you can live in a family that has cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters, and they all try to get involved in your marriage. Now that, does that ever solve anything? No. Now you've got ten chiefs and no Indians. Right? To, to, to use that expression for me. Right? But, you know what I mean? Everybody's the chief. Everybody's trying to give you, you know, instruction on what, how to fix or do this in your marriage. That never works. You need one voice from one shepherd. Right? You need God in your marriage. Husband and wife should decide together on such policies as these. Talking about where you're going to live. Right? Those types of things. Then she should inform her relatives and he his. They must remain firm no matter who opposes. Thousands of divorces would be avoided if this rule were carefully followed. Meaning, get rid of all the extra chiefs. Right? Yes, listen to godly counsel. You know, check out what your parents have to say here and there, but make sure it goes with the Bible. Right? Some parents just give terrible advice to their kids, children. Alright. Establishing your own home. When you establish your own home, what is one of the primary things that the home requires? Do you guys know Psalm 7713? What's Psalm 7713? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What's the rest of the verse? Thy way, O God, is our God. Yes. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God? Psalm 7713. By the way, you should check me. Don't just believe me. You should be flipping your Bible. That's what it says in Psalm 7713. If you forget, look it up. Because maybe I'm the devil and I'm exporting it to you like you did to Jesus in the wilderness, right? You left out a part. Don't allow me to do that to you. I miss a part. Correct me on it. I'm just as fallible as any of you. So, what is the sanctuary? What's another name for the sanctuary in the Bible? There's a couple names. Home. It's the what? Home. Home. Okay, home. Give me another bigger name. House. The house of who? House of God. The house of God or the house of the Lord, right? So if the sanctuary is a model home, a model house, do you think it has any instruction regarding establishing a private home? Is your home a house of the Lord or no? Yes. It's not a house of the Lord, it's a house of devils. Okay. Right? Oh, right? Yes. Okay. So look into the sanctuary. You have the outer yard, right? What is in the outer yard? Also sacrifice. Sacrifice should be in your marriage, first and foremost. Not selfishness. Sacrifice. You gotta learn when to give up that argument. You gotta learn to give up that certain thing. I'm not saying you can't battle the truth. That's how sometimes arguments or disagreements happen in marriage. You gotta stand ground at that point. Right? I'm talking about when it's just arguing to lift up self. I'm right no matter what, and I don't care what the other person says. Wrong attitude. Sacrifice. What's the next thing? Uh, Labor. Labor. What's in the labor? Water. And? What they wash. What they wash. The blood. What? The blood. Water and blood, right? You're talking about baptism. You gotta be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Every sacrifice, that sacrifice shall be burnt with fire. You gotta baptize it. And in baptism, does self live or is self dead? If you guys don't know, take a look at Romans chapter 6. Look at Romans 6, please. Romans 6. Romans 6. I'm telling you, this study is... I'm not even leaving point one yet. Because people pass over this study like it's nothing. It's everything. People want to talk about victory over the Sabbath. You can't do that unless you have victory over this first. 
Because marriage came before Sabbath. The church came before Sabbath. So the Sabbath was made for the man, Adam. Romans 6, please. Take a look at chapter 6. Amen. Verse 1. Ready? Amen. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in? Sin. That grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were what? Baptized. baptized into Jesus Christ. So you're not just baptized in water. You're baptized into who? A person, Jesus Christ. We're baptized into what? His death. His death. And if he died to sin, then the home of the Lord should teach you to be what? Dead, dead to sin. You're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we are buried with him. But Paul, in another place, says, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I. How many eyes are there? One. Two. Two. There's I, the old man of sin, and I, the new man in Christ. And I, the old man of sin, is dead, buried, gone. The new man gets to live. That's Jesus. We are buried with him by baptism into death. By the way, that's second death. The old man shouldn't get back up. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory, that's the character of the Father, even so we also should what? Walk in what? Yes. Newness of life. It's like my marriage, my relationship needs newness. Here it is. It tells you how to do it. For if we have been, what's that word? Planted. What did God do in Genesis? He planted a garden. He didn't say he created there. He says he planted it there. So if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, crucified to self on the cross, right? We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, when can you have the likeness of his resurrection? Okay. Right now. You're coming out of the... Right now. If you're born again, don't, aren't you in the likeness of Jesus? Yes. You can have the likeness of Jesus and thought in mind and heart now. You're going to get the physical later. You're going to be a glowing being later. That's a physical resurrection. But God is looking to revive the mind and heart now. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Jesus, that the body of sin might be what? Verse 6, please. Might be. Wait, God, I'm sorry. Don't be distracted. Be destroyed. Don't be. It will be destroyed. It might be destroyed. That henceforth, from this time forward, we should not. not did sin. you see how not then he told you how to have the likeness? He wasn't waiting till the end of time. He said, "Right now we can have it, and we don't serve sin now." Right. So in the sanctuary, talking about the home of the Lord, right? It's His house. It's the first original model home. If you want to know how to do it? God showed us in the sanctuary. This is the model home. Here it is. So, we got the sacrifice. Should sacrifice be in your home and in your marriage? Yes. Yeah, how about death itself? Yes. Right? Baptize the Holy Spirit. What was the very next thing, be careful, what was the next thing beyond the labor? I want to sit down here for just a minute. What was the very next thing beyond the labor? I want you to be careful. The what? The baby. Ah, you're thinking for anger. The entrance. The yeah, entrance. Baby. The veil separates the outward courtyard from what? Holy, holy, place. holy place. The actual home. Because that word is just the gate and the yard, right? The court yard. So it would be like it's if this door were the first veil. The Bible, the book of Hebrews says the veil was Jesus' flesh. We enter in through him. He's the veil. So when people come into your home, like if you had a long, hard day at work, what stays outside? The beast. What stays outside? The beast. What comes in? Jesus. Jesus. I preach Oh. Leave all that worry, doubt, fear out there. It's in. Burn it out there. You need prayer out there? Go pray out there before you enter this door. And there's another door. Second day. There's a door into the living room, right? What was in God's living room? Three things. Tell me. Uh, table of showbread on the north side. Right? The right side. What was on the left or south side? Candlestick. Seven branch candlestick. And what was dead center facing west? The incense. The altar of incense, right? Absolutely. What does that tell you should be in the home? In the marriage? She had showbread that says the word of God. God's word, center, right? 
tribe of the north. That's where God rules from. Which would be what? Ruling your life. The Bible says God sits on the sides of the north. That's the table of sugar. Place from the Father, place from the Son. Two stacks of six, right? The Son lives by every word of the Father. We ought to live by every word of Jesus. Two stacks. So this rules. What about the other thing? Light. Light? So witnessing, right? Can you witness in your own home? Yes. Right? Like when somebody says something mean that shouldn't be there in the home, what should you do? Turn the other cheek. Don't register. Right? Because right? you're dead. You didn't register the, the smiting that they gave you. I think your cooking is ugly. You know what I mean? What? Run away from it. So you can't have constructive criticism. <laughs> right? It's too much salt. you got to make you got to say something. Otherwise, we're all going to die of high blood pressure. But I'm talking about this unkind word. And if you get that, or action, or look, can you kill somebody with a look? Yes. Yeah, man. I've daggers. Yeah. Axes. You know. I died so many times. <laughs> be careful. You're being recorded. All right. All right? So in the home should be witnessing. Who are you witnessing for? The Lord. The Bible says we are his witnesses. Who is his? The Lord. The Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Even the Father too also, right? So witness in your home, in the marriage, and to the children, and to your guests. What's the other object? The altar, altar is incense. A symbol of? A symbol of? Prayer. Prayer. Mm. Prayer should be at the center of your home. If you're having problems, it is usually because the word is at the center. There's little prayer, right? And there's little real witnessing. What we're doing is showing off the devil and pride. We got the word of some man or some other book now trying to tell us how to run it other than this book, right? And then prayer, we're usually talking to somebody else. Gossip about your wife, about your husband. Right? That's what leads to the division in the home. Put all that away. Whatever's in the home, just let it stay there. Bury it. Don't go around telling everybody else about what this, this, and the other. You're only creating problems for yourself because husband and wife are? One. One. If you're attacking your wife or you're attacking your husband in front of others, who are you going to be attacking? You might as well stick yourself a knife and just start sticking yourself. That's what you're doing. You're not injuring them. You're injuring you. All the while thinking you're doing yourself benefit. A lot of people have an absolutely wrong concept of marriage. It's about a dime. The marriage symbolized the unity between the Father and the Son by the Holy Ghost. The husband represents the Father and the woman represents the Son because he's in a submitted position to the Father. Because the Father's the head of the house, as the Bible says. And when there's disharmony, when one tries to lift himself up above another, you get division, you get breaking. Imagine if the Son said, No, Father, I'm going to do it this way. Would heaven be unified? No. And what if the Father said something to the Son that took no consideration into the feelings of the Son, just did it anyway? Would the Son respond in love? No. Something would be broken, then, wouldn't it? What if the spirit just said, ah, I'm doing my own thing. Get you to. The spirit of the devil. So, establish your private home. The Lord has showed us in the home. So, I'm now in the living room, right? That's how you should live every day. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray uh, without ceasing. It means pray daily, all the time. And then your witness should always be shining, right? Don't let the lamp burn out. What was the next veil? To the most holy into the most holy place, right? What was in there? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of God's Covenant. What did God do upon the Ark of God's Covenant? What does it say? The Shekinah glory. What, what did it do? He rested. He what? Rested. He rested. What are you doing there? He rests. That's the, the master room. Right? This is the living room. That's the master room. And in there is the most intimate relationship between husband and wife, and also as the personal closet between you and God. And what goes on in there should stay where? In there. Like if I'm in my private closet and I'm praying to God, so between me and God, I'm not including my wife, right? Or perhaps your husband, right? Because you need an individual relationship. What goes on in there, I confess my sins unto Him. I'm naked before God in there. He sees me for who I really am. There's no clothes, there's no hiding. It's me and God alone. 
And then when I pray, I should understand that. I should trust him absolutely. Otherwise, I'm keeping apart from myself. He can already see it. God already knows. But that doesn't heal a relationship. I have to be wholly open with him. Fully known before God. And therefore, between husband and wife, what's going on in there? And I'm not really talking about physical things. I'm talking about all of it together. Husband and wife, you've got to be totally honest with one another. And try not to do it in front of the children. If you got to have a, a disagreement, do it in there. Separate. Because if the children see it, and they go, oh, this is how a relationship works. I need to disagree with my sister. I need to disagree with my brother. I need to have a fight in the open. I need to take it from here and then spread it all around out there. Here's what my sister did. Here's what my brother did. And see how it affects the church and now society? Where did it start? Is this heavy? Yes. I'm not point, I'm not point what? What? Because people read through this and rush through it so bad, and that's why the very sports says half the people are divorced. They never understood what marriage was in the first place. They thought marriage was for their own pleasure. They thought marriage was my happiness, nobody else. Marriage is really about making someone else happy. The sacrifice. Death, duty, and heart struggles. Through sickness, right? All those things. You got a vow to give up some personal things when you entered into this relationship with somebody else. You don't get to cling to everything you were before. You made a sacrifice. Sometimes it's a giving up a friend, sometimes it's a giving up a, a, a way. Like for alcohol, you gotta give it up. Yes. You wanna heal? You gotta give it up. You gotta make the decision and the choice. For some, it's smoking. For some, it's something else. It could be diet, it could be meat, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you put in there. I know most people didn't know this when they entered into marriage. But before God, that's what it is. And God says, if you don't know, you're ignorant, he what? He winks. He winks at it. Well, is that all he does? He says, but now he's asking every man to repent. Yes, he winked at it before, but once he gives you knowledge, because God wants you to it's all true, he loves you too much, he leaves you ignorant, now repent. Do the right thing. Make sure that's the wrong. All right. Establishing your own home. You guys understand about the master room? So God himself is resting on his bed, right? Join with me. Start with your own personal devotion, and then family living room worship, right? Right? Yes. There's actually a reason why we do all these things here on Small. Most people have forgotten why we do these things. I think it's custom. It was never custom. It was from God's word. I just forgot where it is. All right, number two. Just as important as number one. I'm going to tell you something. It's just like this. What is this called? The Bible. It is the Bible. What is it called? The Word. The Word of God. Word God. Now, is it inspired? Yes. yes. It's inspired, right? He established His Word. What's the next thing He had to do to it? What's the, what, do you, what do you mean continue? Read. Uh, you have to read. Study. Oh. We talked about it. We talked about what? Preserve. Preserve. So first you established your home, then what do you got to do to it? You got to preserve it. It doesn't just keep itself. It needs maintenance. Like, look around. The floor gets dirty, the windows get dirty, the stuff on the floor, you got to wash your dishes, your clothes. What happens to your marriage? It gets dirty. You got to maintain it. <laughs> Sometimes you got to go through a hard wash cycle, right? An intense heat drying, right? It's just, my marriage is damp. It's just depressing. But if there's some heat. Don't suffer for God through persecution by witness of his word in your own home by turning away from that angry word at you. You'll get heat real quick because they want to fight. They want you in the fight. Right? Because the devil wants you to fight. So the other person is going to try and egg you on. Don't let them do that. You tell them, I need to go pray to God. Right now. Don't try and... I'm leaving. If you got to leave the house, dude, go do it. I've been in conversations on theological matters. And people just start getting heated. You realize your voice is getting heated. You're like, wait a minute, i got to check myself. That's the Holy Spirit talking to me. And I just told them, because my heart hardly wants to continue fighting, because I know I can win. Right? <laughs> I, don't play, I don't play games with God's word. I'm just like, I'm, ah! you know? <laughs> right? It's easy for me. The hard part for me is go, okay, take a breather. i, I got to go pray. I've had to do that. Because otherwise, I was about to get like, 
God is not justified by any of that stuff. Satan won the whole side. The real win is when it stopped. God's the God of peace. Give me peace. Peace. Peace to me. So, inspiration or establishing, then preservation or in your that's a very important word. What's the first part of that word? Court. Does the Lord have a court? The court yard. You see, the courtyard is all about court. Shit. If you got a problem in your marriage, start back in the beginning. Where did I go wrong? Is it wrong in my sacrifice? Am I, am I not dead, buried in baptism? That I did not enter into the veil? That I bring in my problems from the world? I'm not saying you can't discuss those things with your wife and your husband. Right? I'm talking about leave your anger out there. Frustration out there. Don't pour it out upon your, your wife or your husband all the time. It'll just make them sour and bitter. Pour it out to God. He's heard it before. He can handle all the sin of the world. And now we come home clean. Hey, my wife. Hey, husband. Hug. Give me, hug the kids. Have a good time with them. Why do you bring all that filth from the world into your own home? Let me ask you this. If I just took some big, muddy boots, because this is Samoa. Why should it be that tight? It doesn't work this well. But in Samoa or Eastern countries, I got my big, muddy boots. I just come stomping through your living room. I jump up all and down to your couches and in all of your master bedroom. What would you think of me? Oh, no. Right? Now, you're telling me you're going to take the stuff that's out of the world and you're going to bring it into your home and then trample it all over your kids and all over your wife. What's more valuable, the furniture or your husband, wife, and children? Leave the dirty shoes out there. What's the question there? I'm talking about not bringing in the problems of the world. Leave them out there. Because you wouldn't allow me to bring in all that dirt in here. I get strained there, right? Why are you tracking your mother up in my house all on my carpet? Why do that to your husband, your wife, or your children? Does that make sense? Natural, spiritual. That's all we're doing. Who knew God would make me a, a marriage counselor? Anyway. <laughs> I, I laugh. I laugh. Anyway. All right. Let's take a look at some texts. Take a look at 1 Peter 4 8. Not up there because it's the RSD version. Mm -hmm. It's the reviled substantive reverse. Anyway. What? 1 Peter 4 8. Take a look at King James. 1 Peter 4 8. For those that have different Bible versions, <laughs> Take it with a grain of salt, study with me, and I'll show you why we use the King James. See, I still want to use my other version. That's fine, but know why you use it. Still use my son. Yeah, fine. I'm not, I'm not playing against the Or the French or the Italian or whatever. First Peter 4, 8. 8. Now, it says, and what? Above all things. Right? What's above all things? Have. No. Oh, Jesus. What, I mean is, what, what does it mean to have a, above everything? What, what's another word? Above everything. Uh, priority. Mm. Priority. Mm. First. One word. Something that's above everything. What do you call it? Superior. Superior or? First word. Supreme. 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 Right? Very good. It's supreme. It's the cheapest. It's the highest. It's the, the goal, right? So, and above how much? Oh. Everything. What? And fervent. That hand. fervent what? Charity. Now that word charity means self-sacrificing love. It doesn't mean a handout. That's modern modern language. Charity in the Bible is the self-sacrificing love of God. It's that which gives, right? Because they see that there's a need. When God saw this, we were without love, He gave His love, right? We saw we without light, He gave His light. We saw we without knowledge, He gave His knowledge. That's charity. That's the real love of God. But notice what kind of charity? One for the. No, no, what is the kind of charity? Tell me right now first. Fervent. Fervent. What does that mean? I look for no doubt. Ah. Uh, like, I was desiring. That's very close. Not anxious, but like you're. Like always continuous? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like fervent heat. Passion. Fiery. Fiery. Right? Because what is God's love? It's fire. It's passion. It's fire. He loves us with an everlasting love, right? So when it says, above all things have fervent charity, it means have the fiery love of God in you. Right? And what else? Among who? Among yourselves. Now remember, just talking about the church in general, but where did the church start? In the home. Husband and wife. So where must the fervent charity begin? So if you see your husband or your wife without love, what do you got to do? Love. You see them without mercy, what do you got to do? Mercy. Mercy. You see them without light, what do you got to give them? Light. You see them without truth, what do you got to give them? Truth. Truth. In love, right? I'll show you the truth and throw a Bible at you, right? Because that's another fight, right? I'll show you truth. Ah! 
Well, it was true, and you did throw it at him, so that's not exactly the fulfillment of that verse. It says, among yourselves, notice the word among, because remember, when the Bible talks about the fervent love, it's really talking about God. When it says among you, you need the person among you. It's not an idea. You need the Holy Ghost, who represents Jesus, who's the fiery God of love, right? the Son of the Father. So when you have love among you, you have Emmanuel, who is God with us, amongst us, walking with my marriage day by day, husband and wife. He's not among them. He's out there somewhere. And then the devil is among you. The, the, the devil cannot stand in the presence of God. Sin can't last. It's perfect. It might last a brief moment, but it can't last. So if you have God there, Sin will be driven out. So, why? For what? For charity. Okay, charity means self-sacrificing love, right? Just so we're not confused. It's not a handout. Shall what? Cover. Cover. The multitude of sin. It doesn't expose it. It doesn't go out of the world and say, here's what my wife, here's what my husband does to me day by day. Now, if you're in danger, and I'm talking physical abuse, we'll see one. The Bible does not command you to stick around and get abused the whole time. If you're in danger of your life, you are free to leave. It doesn't say get divorced. There's only one reason for divorce in the entire Bible, and that's fornication. But it doesn't say you can't leave and find a place of safety. I'll give you an example. Jesus was taken by the people he was supposed to love. He did love, but did they love him? No. Nope. No. What did they do to him? Crucified. Well, one, they arrested him. They, we go right to the crucifixion. They did a lot more before that. Torture. Torture. Spit it upon him, blind him, mocked him, hated him, angered him. They said evil things about him. They lied about him, right? Bore false witness against him, right? He didn't eat any meal for the last 24 hours of his life. The only thing they gave him was the, the sponge, right? So hungry, all that stuff. Would you call that abuse? Yes. Would you call that physical abuse? Yes. Spiritual abuse? Yes. Mental abuse? Yes. Right? Verbal abuse? Yes. Imagine being hung up naked in front of everybody in the whole street. Right out there. No one thought. We have all these images of Jesus. The Romans were not merciful. So, after Jesus resurrected from the dead, he immediately ran right back to Herod and said, Do it again. No. He went right back to Pilate and said, Do it again. Is that what he did? No. no. He left. He didn't go back and try and give you more abuse. So, take an example from Jesus. There's other examples in the Bible I can give you, but I'm not. Taking a lot of time on that. So if you are in danger, yes, please, you have the right to go. Take your children if you have to. Whether that's husband or wife. It's usually the male abusing the wife, but there are also cases about I think 20% or so. It's the other way around. And that's just the real the devil uh, destroying the, the woman. Okay, so continue your courtship. So we got this, right? So it says covering what? Cover the multitude. Cover the multitude. You pray and ask for forgiveness of one another. Just be honest with them. Just talk to them like they're a person. Right? Trust them. In fact, if you don't trust them, place a little bit of trust in them anyway. Show them that you're willing to go that far. Easy to take an extra jab. Right? Show them, you're like, I'm still willing to trust you. I'm still willing to let this thing work. As far as possible. Proverbs 31.28. Let's take a look. We don't get through this today. We are going to be continuing this. Proverbs 31, 28. Oh, 31. This is more for husbands than it is for wives, but you get there? Okay, can somebody read that for me, please? Her children arise up, all the blessed. Okay, part one, right? Next part. Her husband also. And he's crazy. Okay, so the children rise up. They get up, right? Early in the morning. What should the children do? Morning. Call her what? Yes. Why? Yes. She's a blessing. Well, she is. But it says call her blessed. It's a self-recognition of where you, the child, came from. You were a gift to your father and your mother. Who 
gay people? Who's gay than children? Just because two people get together physically does not honestly make it children. You can ask you know, all the people that were buried in the Bible, right? Like Abraham and Sarah. They were buried for quite a long time. Just because two people get together 13 times a day, <laughs> it doesn't matter. God has to give the increase. Right? Yes. Yes. I'm talking about newly married couples. <laughs> <laughs> Fervent love, it's fervent charity, right? So God gave the increase, and so the child must recognize that they were to be a blessing to their father and their mother, and the mother especially because she's the one that bore with them nine months plus, right? Many months, right? And I've gone over this with many others. As soon as the woman gives birth, her job is over, right? No. No. What happens next? Care for them. So you carry them nine months, and then what do you do? Carry them. You carry them some more. You see, the job of a mother is never done. You're always carrying that child, even if it's carrying them in their heart. Yes. It doesn't matter whether your son is 50 or your daughter is 50 years old. A true mother always carries, is always praying for their children. Amen. They're always praying. They, they, once they have that gift, they're never letting go of that gift. That's what's wrong with a lot of people, especially in America. They think, oh, I've got to birth this child, and after college, I let him go and do nothing, and never talk to him. No. It's calling them up when they least expect it and saying, I haven't heard from you in a while. I love you. Let them know. You're always carrying them. So when it says, her children rise up and call her blessed, yes, she is blessed by God with those children, but the children should recognize why they were given to her. What's the next part? That's part one. Her husband oh, okay. also. Oh, I also, uh, one part of them, it says, arise up. You just got children to sit down and don't ever honor you. They don't get up in your presence. Like immediately, they sit down. Like, Wait, 10 more minutes, Mama, I'm playing my video game. Yes. They did not honor their mother. Right? So when it says arise up, you get up and leave. All right, so, husband, what? Also. also. Sees your wife, what do you got to do? Wife! I haven't seen you in the last two minutes. Come here. <laughs> right? Hey, man, sometimes two minutes is an eternity, right? You ever been waiting in a line? It's like, man, it's been two minutes. <laughs> yeah, we don't relate that to the marriage. We're like, man, I miss my wife. You know, how has it been? 30 seconds! <laughs> I miss my wife already. And I'm not talking about, you know, this vindictive, like, control freak type stuff. It's just like, you know, your love. Because there are people that can't even let their wife or their husband out of their sight for 10 minutes. i got to know what they're doing. That's not love. That's not trust. That's a control issue. All right? But, yeah, that's exactly what that is. That, that's prison. It's hell. So her husband also sees that the husband... Why did you marry them in the first place? Was it for money? Land? What? Just because you like the cooking? You know, there's takeout now. You need a wife for that. Any <laughs> chef you want. <laughs> Just 20 bucks. You don't have to see it again. So, husband also, and what? So he rises up, greets his wife. What's he do? Praises. 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 This is where men fail a lot. What we do is because we're very task oriented, things weren't done. What, what do we do? We criticize. We immediately attack, right? Because right? especially for the man, the warrior, it's always on the attack. I see something wrong, I need to attack it. it it's very the way it's ingrained. But praising her for all the things that she does. You know, men used to write poetry for She's their wives. The they used to sing songs for their wives. Oh, they used to do things for their wives. They used to praise them for raising their children. For being at home. Because a woman gives up a lot to raise a family, right? <laughs> at least you should. These days, we've got okay. women that work, you know, 40 mm -hmm. plus hours a week. They don't really focus on a family. I'm not saying there's not times when that needs to be done. Don't make the, the exception the rule. <laughs> Great. I'm not saying you can't have constructive criticism. We all need that. I will teach the things I love, I rebuke and chase you. We all step forward and repent, right? And the husband is to be like Jesus. And sometimes you got to have a, a little rebuking, right? 
Remember, a little correction. Otherwise, things get sloppy. Things get out of hand real quick. So there has to be this give and take. But praise. When's the last time you did that? I mean, you guys know what praise is? When we say praise the Lord, that's not really praising the Lord. You recognize that, right? That's just saying a sentence. What if I just went around saying, it says praise her. So, praise you, my wife. Is that praising her? No. Then when we say praise the Lord, is that really praising him? No. No, it's just the same. When we say praise the Lord, we literally mean someone. Tell me something about the Lord and his attributes. Yeah. We say praise the Lord. The Lord is mighty, strong, and bound. That's praising the Lord. So when you say praise my wife, you're looking for something to compliment her on. You look beautiful. I like your smile. The cooking was great. The kids are clean. They're in one piece. You know? <laughs> right? Because some days it's just simple, right? It's been a hectic day. You're like, hey, the kids are all here. Awesome job, wife. You know what I mean? Right? That's a monumental task. Imagine, you're trying to control a small army. Especially these guys, four or five kids, right? And me, you know, the unknown. Because there are unknowns that enter your life. Right? That's a monumental task. You should praise them for that. Take them that. Love them. Love on them. I'm not going to explain it to you. You guys should know that. You're married. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah. All right. Not praise. Good. See how, if you really take time to actually read these verses and think about it, like how this, I'm not going to go through this fast. So, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4. Look at 1 Corinthians oh, 7, uh, 34. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 7, 34. By the way, there's, there's hundreds of verses on this stuff, so I'm just going through what they show. Anything Pardon me, if anything else comes to mind. Just making a seven. Powerful chapter, by the way. And verse 32. Oh. All right, let me read it there. Remember, I'm not reading the end. The end is the RSG. I'm reading the end. You read it? Uh, somebody After read the difference in the version of what? Yes, okay, pause right there. Right? Verse 34, you guys got it? Oh, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Hold on, we'll wait. First Corinthians. First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Seven. 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 One of the primary differences is experience. <coughs> Virgin might have some knowledge about what people tell her of what marriage is like. But a wife has intimate knowledge of what marriage is like. Right? I'm not talking about just the physical bedroom. I'm talking about everything. The emotion, the experience, the mind, the heart. Right? There's more to marriage than the, than the physical aspect. So, there is a difference. The virgin is remaining with her parents, right? Remember. Genesis, right? They still under the parents' name. Now the wife is now having to bring in a different relationship, different experience. Now they're relying upon each other and God. So you have a difference. There's a bunch more there. All right, next. The unmarried, right? Unmarried woman <coughs> carry over the things of the Lord, mm -hmm. that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. All right, that's good right there. There's some of the the virgin, it doesn't have all the worry of children, all the worry of all that other stuff that goes with marriage, the problems the devil throws in. They don't have any of that worry. They got the problems of the virgin, right? You can think male or female, it doesn't matter. It's primarily talking about female. But, that she may be both holy, both in what? Body and spirit. So heart and mind, right? And flesh. Body and spirit, right? Flesh, that can be through diet, that can be through clothing, that can be through a bunch of things. Right? Wash and keep clean, right? You know some people when they get married, they let themselves go. Oh yeah. Right? I found my trophy wife. I found my trophy husband. I don't need to do my fifty two hour workout like I used to do before I got married. Right? I don't gotta run, I don't gotta eat healthy, I can just <laughs> Right? Let it all go. That's husband and wife, by the way. That's not just the one. Wife's like, finally, I got the man. He's providing for me. I just let it all go. <laughs> Who told you that rule? 
I don't remember that in any of the vows of marriage. Like, as soon as you said, I do, it's like, all right, I can unzip. Ah. I must go to the store in my pajamas. <laughs> Sometimes you might have to go to the store. Right? All right? So, does that make sense? No. Just because you get married, continue to keep those things in mind about keeping your body and mind, heart, on the Lord and His ways. Don't just let it go, because if you begin to let it go between your husband and wife, you're also going to start letting go between you and the Lord. Right? I mean, is this making sense? Am I just preaching to rocks? No. Okay, there's nobody stony hearted here. <laughs> But she that is married cares for what? The things of the world. What does that mean? Next part. How she may please her husband. Right. You basically, you have a lot more worried involved about the family, uh, children, keeping things clean, because things get messy with a lot of children, right? So it takes away, it becomes a distraction in that sense. It takes away from the time that she used to have. She might have used to spend like 13 hours studying her Bible. Just an exaggeration, right? Maybe it's four hours like this. Right? But now because you've got the family, the children, the cooking, the cleaning, and all the other stuff that you didn't really have before, now you're down to 30 minutes. So it enters into your spiritual time between husband and wife and you and the Lord, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. And you're in your family. Set the children up. Now tonight we're going to have our 30 minutes with my children because children can't, they can't take it very long. You know, short attention to this. Especially this modern age. But try to enter it with them and you'll have more time that way. Spend 30 minutes on your own. Well, you got that time, and you spend 30 minutes a minute, and now you got an hour. Okay? A lot of a lot of those, especially for women, they forget how to please their husband. Not bad. And a, and a lot of that reason is because sometimes the husband asks the wrong things of them. They're asking things that they shouldn't be asking their wife to do. Talk about or think about. If the husband is asking you to do anything wrong that's not of the Lord, then don't do it. Because your first Lord is God in heaven. Okay? That goes for spiritual things and physical things. There are, there are physical things that happen in the bedroom that should never happen in the family of God. Can I be straight with you? Can I speak plain? I know there's children here. Like, there's anal things that go on in marriages that should never go on, according to God's word. It was not for that use and not for that purpose. And I'm just talking about that one thing. There's a hundred things that should never go on in marriage. Because I used to know that word. All the stuff that goes on behind closed doors, and people think, oh, that's sanctified Lord, because the marriage sanctifies it, right? The marriage bed. No. Remember, it's not of the Lord. It's not in here. And it should be left out of the marriage. You know the people that are into like BDSM, fatal masochist stuff, like beating their husband or beating their wife, like they enjoy it? Is that married? Is that the marriage relationship? I'm talking about physical things. No. Because there's children here, I'm going to leave it at that. There's a lot more I can get into. If you don't know what it is, then ask the Lord to show you what's right or wrong. Don't come to me. Please. Mm -hmm. You may not like what I say. For the Lord. You ask the Lord whether it's right or wrong, whether you should be doing this or that in your bedroom. And you, you can talk about foreplay, you can talk about all that stuff, right? Okay, moving on. <laughs> all right. Just love one another and be safe. <laughs> Romans 12.10. Like if this was just an adult-only seminar, I would just put it up on the screen for you. If you'd be basically looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? But just because, well, we're married, it's all good. No. Well, yes, spiritually speaking. So, Romans 12, verse 10. Here we go. Who's there? Anybody there? All right, let's keep, read that thing. Good. affection. One to another with brotherly love. And the last part? Right. That means you place the other person first. I know the husband is the head of the family. But in this sense, it's saying, prefer one another. It says, 
honor preferring one another. In the marriage context, place your wife first. Place your husband first. Above your own desire. And the Lord before both of them. In general, this is about general relationships. Our relationship. How should we deal with one another here? Put King first. Put Oni first. Put Emily first, right? Above myself. They need help. I'm really trying to help them. Above what I think I need to do. Put them first. Self comes last. What happened to the Bible say if you put yourself first? You become last. Right? What you really want, you don't get. So that just, that's not just between husband and wife. That, that goes through all society. I really try to teach the, the little children, uh, just children here that, like, hey man, just because they're used to it, they don't need to have it right away. Like, they're using it for a little while. They're getting tired of it in 10 seconds. They can play with it for 10 seconds. They're just jealous because they have it in hand. That's all, that's all that that is. All right. So, can you see the preservation? Because preservation takes work. Remember, God gave to them in being a garden. What did he tell them to do? Rest and keep. Right? You've got to preserve the garden. What happens if you don't preserve your garden? Weeds. Weeds, grass, whatever goes on out there. Same thing for marriage. Same thing for brother, sister, father, mother, relationship. I mean, you ever heard of long distance relationships? You speak the longer you part, you, you talk further and further apart, eventually what happens to the friendship? Further and further apart. So imagine how that starts in a marriage. You start off real close, like this close. Mm, wife in the morning, right? And later throughout the day, you get angry at them. You're like, I don't even want to see your face. <laughs> and then later on, you get angry because you did something. Now you're out the door. You're sleeping somewhere. And then in your morning, you said, let's get a divorce. It started here, right? This close to us. It didn't start way out there. That's where it ended up. Trace it back to the root. The seed uprooted there. All right. You gotta have preservation. You have to have the Holy Ghost. Because think of this way. Who is the one that really preserves this book? God. It's God, right? By the way. Then what's really preserving the marriage? You? No. No, you gotta you have a work to do with God. But if God doesn't change the heart, you could stir that dirt all day long and things grow. It takes faith. Hope, love. The greatest of these is love. 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 Charity is the Bible. Self sacrifice and love. How much time is that? I get five more minutes to close. We'll close it out at this point. So, how many points did you get to so far? Two. Just two. two. Are they very important points? Yes, very important. That's why it's, you've got to start with those two points establish, preserve. If you don't know what's established in your home, this is what we'll establish for you right here. I built a house upon the rock. What's a house? A home. The home is not a home without a marriage. Build your house upon the rock. Establish it. Find what is true. Find out what you're doing wrong. For yourself first. Don't just go to your husband or your wife and say, this is what you're doing wrong. No. Self first, then address the other person. Take the beam out of your own eye. Right? Take that out. And then you can see the deal with your brother answer. Last point. Let's just continue. We'll perhaps revive the courtesies. Notice courtesies. The court courtesies. Don't be Pharisees. Don't be Sadducees. Be the courtesies. Right? Of courtship. Courtyard. Sacrifice. Very good Christ. In your married life. Successful marriages do not just what? But that's the problem today. People think it just happened. Hollywood knows how to do it. You just got that guy and that guy because he read the stars and boom, that's the marriage made in heaven. Nope. They must be they must be developed. Like film, right? Getting built upon. Just because you said I do did not end the marriage, what did it do? It began the marriage. They don't just say I do and that's the end. I mean, you think, think of it like this. I got baptized in the church and that's all I got to do. No. 
you got to build. you got to build on your knowledge and the wisdom of God. you got to learn how to live right, right, eat right, think right, speak right. you got to grow up in the Lord. It's like, like, like him. Same with marriage. Keep love what? Growing by expressing love. And that doesn't just mean to say, hey, I love you. Remember, it's self-sacrifice. And sometimes you've got to give that thing up. Excuse me, this is the second I know. Don't take each other for what? What does that mean? Appreciate. appreciate like they're there, therefore they owe you something. Right? They said I do, therefore they have to. Don't do that. Don't abuse the value. So don't take them for granted. Just because they're there, don't misuse them. Say, I'll never leave. They're stuck in their mouth. <laughs> So don't take it for granted, or the monotony, the sameness that results will destroy your marriage, right? And, and it's really the monotony that gets in the way a lot of the time. A dull drum, so to speak. The wind just can't. There's no more love in our sails. There's no fire. Right. Hmm. Well, where do, you, where do you get the fire? Do you build the fire? Where does the fire come from? Fire comes from heaven. Read this. You want love back in here? Read this thing together. Overcome together. All right, keep your love growing by expressing love for one another, or it will die. die. If God's fire in the sanctuary, in the home, did not constantly get oil poured in, what was going to happen to it? Die off. It's going to die. It's going to go dark. I don't feel the heat anymore. Yeah, there's no oil in the Holy Spirit there. There, there was no constant. The work of the priest, the work of the husband, was to constantly make sure there was oil going on. Prayer. Bread on the table, right? Or you will drift apart, right? It becomes up and separates you. Love and happiness are not found by seeking them what? For yourself. For yourself. They're not selfishness. Marriage is the opposite of that. It's a fullness of the demonstration of the sacrifice of the Father and the Son by and through the Holy Ghost. But rather by giving them happiness and love to others. If all you... For instance, I'll put my all I did was seek massages for myself. I never gave it to anybody else. That's selfishness, right? Yeah. Right? It just make me feel good. No, I want you to feel good too. I want you to be just as happy. Otherwise, how do I really have happiness if you're miserable and I'm happy? Is that really happiness? But we're all happy together. So spend as much time as possible. Notice the word possible. I know there's things in the way, there's work, there's stories, there's whatever. Doing things what? Together. Together. And that doesn't mean get on each other's nerves. Don't force it. Try a thing out of here. Try a thing out of here. If you don't do laundry together, try doing laundry together. No, my husband doesn't have a full laundry. I don't have a full laundry. I just do Right? Teach him. Right? Your wife doesn't know how to cook. Teach her. Right? You know how to cook. Learn for your wife. Help around the house. Spend as much time as possible doing things together. Because I hate doing things alone, man. Don't you love it when there's more people in friendship? You're talking the whole time. There's fellowship while you're doing it. Traveling the whole time. Food. Mm-hmm. It's great. If you, would, uh, if you would get along well, learn to <laughs> each other with. <laughs> no, my life. You know, don't fake it. <laughs> <laughs> Right? What I mean, this is talking about, we're talking about entering into the household, people uh, all the problems out there. Yeah. I try and tell, I try and tell them here, especially the guy go around and give him a hug, man. He's been gone for eight hours a day. He needs that. It better recharge the battery. Right? If you got down throughout the day, your boss yelled at you or whatever, you know, that happens. Because the devil's just trying to get on that. Well, you really messed up. You know, that's the worst case. Getting a hug is like, oh, man. <laughs> Who cares what that guy said? Have these guys. Group hug. Okay. Relax. Visit. Shop. Sightsee. Eat together. Don't overlook the little courtesies. Remember, not Pharisees, not Sadducees. Courtesies. What are you going to be? You're going to be courtesies. Right? Okay. Hopefully that'll keep you in your mind. Encouragement. What's the center word of encouragement? Courage. Strengthen. Right? And affectionate acts. Some people like flowers. Some people like a kind word. Some people like a gift. Some people like, you know, just a hug. Some people like a massage. Some people like whatever. 
Some people just want just sit here and just cuddle with me while we watch nothing, you know. Which is usually what's on TV. Nothing. Surprise each other. Notice what's that word? Surprise each other with little gifts or favors. And it doesn't always have to be like something you bought in the store. Sometimes a little surprise or a gift can be something that's a kind word because man, you don't really speak that to me throughout the week, and that's a kind word. Right? That's a gift. Increase those gifts. Shower them with gifts. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Right. Right. It says try to out love. Now, I'm going to preface that, or uh, caution on that. <laughs> don't go around spending any money that you don't have. Right? Like somebody buys you, you know, a nice little, you know, little gift, like this book, and then they, they go out and buy something bigger, and then you go out and buy them a car, and then they go out and buy you, you know, don't do that. You should be out of money really fast, and the marriage will divorce real easy. So, when he says out love, it, it usually comes from the mind and the heart and the spirit, right? Okay? Don't waste a whole checkbook on just trying to outdo each other. That's not what it means. Don't take more out of the marriage than you want. Into it. It means don't be selfish. Don't expect more than, than, than out of your own self. Don't expect them to do every chore in the house. Right? Divorce itself is not what? Destroy your marriage. Well, obviously. It's just really the result of that which already destroyed the marriage. Right? But rather what? Which means self-sacrifice. Give it a chance. What? And that's what we're doing. So, we got to point number two. And we're going to close with prayer. And if you guys have questions, get us free. Ask me later or later tonight or whatever. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord God, you see marriage represented here. Your husband, your wife, every one of your children. I ask the parents special to redeem and bless their marriages. You would make them victorious in their marriage. Their, their marriage to be a witness of heaven and to all of the earth. What God can do to save his people. And I pray and ask that faith. Speak to each one by your Holy Spirit. Help each one to see the name follow you with all their help. Help them to love you with all their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength. And then help them to love their neighbor, their closest neighbor, their husband, their wife, as themselves. Help them to love their children. Help the children love each one another. Help us to love as brothers and sisters. Father in heaven, that we might be able to fulfill it in this creation. Righteousness by faith in the marriage and in the relationship with one another. I ask and pray, God, heal us. Thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus.